um, I might as well get started. I am Kenny Arnett, and I currently am an assistant professor of psychology at Southern Oregon University. But uh, this is my second incarnation. I was previously a physical chemist, and I am embarking on a third incarnation soon. I will no longer be a psychologist. I'll be a rogue consciousness researcher. So I think I'm in the right place for that, but we're going to find out. And I emphasize rogue. My interests are in consciousness, obviously. Um, pulling together my background in chemistry, physics, mathematics, psychology, philosophy, and trying to make a nice soup of it all and try to come out with some answers that at least I can pretend to understand at some point. So today I'd like to give you just a small piece of my work and a very recent extension of it that attempts to come close to answering um, Claude's question a couple of days ago do we have any basis for believing that consciousness could exist outside of the body? He said that we currently don't have such a basis. I would like to give you some ideas that might provide such a basis if I could be so presumptuous. And the computer seems to be set up. So let's go. Get your mic. If it works in the pocket, then it'll, yeah, it'll work in your pocket. Okay. Hundred percent. Yeah, this is hundred percent now. So. Okay. Please forgive the primitive nature of my presentation technology. This is poor person's PowerPoint, otherwise known as Word. <laughs> um, and you see my affiliation and the title of my talk: Philosophical Substance Abuse, Distorting Descartes, and Dismissing Dualism. I'm going to try to come to the defense of Rene Descartes, and we learned recently that I may be able to make him feel better in his time by going backwards <laughs> myself. So, consciousness, what is it? We don't really know, and yet we all have it. The mind-body problem, what is that? Well, that's deeply related to the question of what is consciousness and where does consciousness originate? The mind-body problem is the question of what is the relationship between mind and body? Does body create mind? Or is there something else going on? And two of the major historical points of view are, first, dualism, the idea that mind is primary, independent, not physical, and does not die with the body and does not depend on the body for its existence. This was the predominant view of philosophers and everybody on the planet for a very long time, according to Popper and Eccles. But as scientists uh, began to construct the scientific method and science advanced over time, dualism started to lose its uh, respect. And in fact, ironically, it was Rene Descartes that helped lead to the demise of dualism, even though he was one of its primary proponents. The idea that arose instead of dualism was materialism, which uh, an earlier speaker called physicalism, and that's really essentially the same thing, the idea that the mind is a product of the living brain and ceases to exist when the brain meets its death. Dualism in philosophical and psychological circles has been beaten to death and buried. It no longer is viable. It is over. Anyone who believes in dualism at best is deluded. And so that's me. Descartes' view of substance from his meditations on first philosophy. This is something that I think the physicalists should read so that they know what it is they're denying and denouncing before they do it. Rene Descartes had several ideas had, uh, in, his, in his mind trying to distinguish between mind and body. He said that both mind and body are substances. What is a substance? It's a thing that's capable of existing independently. I found that a rather oblique definition when I first started studying this, but lately um, I started to understand when I heard some ideas about from Aristotle, an example of a non-substance would be a shadow. A shadow requires a source of light and an object. It does not exist independently. It cannot exist without those things. But the source of light and the object can exist without the shadow and can exist independently. So they would be made of a substance. 
Third, Descartes said that the mind is a thinking and non-extended substance. And here's where he started to get into trouble with his third sentence. Whereas the body is non-thinking and extended. What did he mean by extension? Well, it's rather complicated. I, I don't have the time to stand here and read all the quotes that I provide. I'm hoping that you're scanning those as I talk. But his idea of extension included the idea that two things with extension cannot occupy the same physical space. That is, the exclusionary occupation of space by matter, which is a well-known principle in physics. And accordingly, he said, it is certain that I am really distinct from my body and can exist without it. And that's a point-blank statement of dualism. Fifth, he defined an extended su uh, substance as having three dimensions with shape and motion. The body as an extended substance also has the property of exclusionary occupation of, of space, as I was just saying. Seventh, mind and body differ further in that body is divisible physically. It can be cut apart. Whereas mind, he says, is utterly indivisible. And by that he means with physical means, like knives or whatever. And then lastly, the human body is an interactive union of mind and body. And here's another place he got himself in trouble because he could not explain how the interaction occurs. And this, above all else, has been cited as a reason why it's obvious that dualism is false. So, objections? There are many. I just picked one because it's the usual objection and it's what I just stated. If the brain is physical and the mind is non-physical, then how can the brain and the mind interact? This is posed as a rhetorical question, a question with the answer already incorporated into it. By using the term non-physical this way, the person asking such a question is implicitly defining a non-physical entity as not able to interact with a physical entity. That's what makes it non-physical. And so the question contains the answer, and we're supposed to say, oh, you're right, it's over, there is no interactionism, there is no duality, there is no dualism. Well, that's a bit of uh, taking Descartes too far, in my opinion. And materialists have been at this for centuries, picking on poor René Descartes. And he, they have exaggerated and sharpened the other distinctions that he made into a description of the non-physical substance as something that's really untenable. The non-physical mind has neither mass nor energy, is not localizable in any way in space, is not extended in space, does not exist in space has no physical properties whatsoever, has nothing in common with physical things, and is completely independent of anything material and works indep independently of the brain. Okay, that's too much. They've gone over the, le the ledge here, and to, to tell an interactionist that his point of view is that the mind works independently of the brain is to not listen when the guy says, I'm an interactionist. So, no, this is not what Descartes thought. However, it's become the way he's described. My objection, if the body and the mind both fit the definition of substance, according to Descartes, who coined the term to describe things that are substantial, then these two examples of substances must share some common properties. That is the definition of substance. They both have to meet that definition. And this point seems to have escaped the physicalist, materialist thinkers. So how do we gain traction on such a slippery problem? How do we approach the idea and, and generate some ideas about what exactly could another substance besides matter be and mean? So we need some empirical data. And we also need some theoretical help. And I'm going to ask Albert Einstein for help today. And I'm going to, with apologies, ask Brian Green for some help. He was here uh, last weekend for the ICM conference. And he was, shall we say, not exactly intrigued by my ideas. And so um, I apologize to him here. My invoking him in this talk, if he were here, he would be outraged. And I'm sorry he's not here. <laughs> what do I call empirical data? Here's where I get myself in even more trouble. The near-death experience. Most of you have probably heard of this. This occurs usually when a, po a person uh, comes close to physical death or actually physically dies and is resuscitated. There are many, many thousands bordering, well, there are millions